I want to take a moment and pause in our trek forward through the New Testament and go back to something that we've already read. And Scott did a fantastic job preaching through the book of First and Second Corinthians. I'd like to highlight one verse and try to look at everything around it and highlight this idea that love doesn't keep score. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13, 5. When you speak to people who are in the congregation of the Lord's church, do you walk away uh, with a sense of social paralysis that maybe, maybe you said the wrong thing? And, you know, maybe they're going to hang this thing over your head and, well, maybe they could have taken it in such a way and misconstrued it. And do you spend a lot of time going back to people who you've had conversations with and saying things like, hey, I hope you, you know how I meant that. And I, I hope that you, you know I wasn't trying to insult you. I, I meant it in the best way possible. I know a lot of people that do that. In fact, I have a lot of those con conversations. And I don't preach this for those people specifically. I, I preach this because I've noticed something in God's Word and in my life that I can share through the book of 1 Corinthians. This idea that love doesn't keep score. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That phrase there, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, I have to start by saying, when you offer someone uh, grace, when you're merciful to someone, when they slight you, uh, when someone does something wrong, obviously in the book of 1 Corinthians, what Paul highlights is we shouldn't glory in other people's wrongdoing and say, look how loving we are because we can, we can turn a blind eye to anybody's sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6. It was to their shame that they were doing these things. So what I'm about to tell you is not to turn a blind eye to people's sin and to allow it to creep into the congregation, but instead it is an attitude that was severely lacking in the congregation. Now the congregation of Corinth uh, was influenced by a lot of people. Um, there are some scholars that believe that there was a group called the, the Sophists, which would have been from ancient Greece, and this sort of idea that had a resurgence um, here in Corinth. Their philosophy, and they were philosophists, was might makes right. And there were a lot of other philosophies that you, that you can see Paul argue against in 1 Corinthians. So that's an idea. There are others who, who today think that it could be the... Um, the Roman philosophy and the Stoics, we would call those people, those people believe that you were to do what you could with the tools that you had and that your personal value was determined by one's self-control and mastery of talent. So that could have also been a, a severe influence to the church and what they had going on. And then... There is clearly an influence on this congregation of the vile, sinful nature and worldliness that was around them. They saw a lot of prostitution. They saw a lot of lies, murder, wickedness. They were in a, a place that was a, a hub for merchants. It was a place where everybody came. And, and anytime you have a lot of foot traffic in an area, you're going to have a lot of people making mistakes, a lot of wickedness. This just so happened to be the hub of wickedness. Uh, and the church was right in the middle of it. So that also had, that played a role in what they were struggling with and some of the influence that was on this church. But I want you to think about something. 
They, they faced many of the same problems that we face today, but they, they had something. They had spiritual gifts imparted to these Christians. They had miraculous ability. So when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and you read in the beginning, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, have not love, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. These Christians had miraculous power given to them by the Holy Spirit, and they still were influenced by the world around them. It was still something that plagued the congregation. So there was an attitude problem. So I want you to think about this. <clears throat> we'll start in verse 1 through 3 that we read. I want you to think that without love, we are nothing. Whether it be the sophists, whether it be the stoics, whether it just be the debauchery around them, Paul argued against three things, and he, he gives a conclusion at the end of each one of these statements that helps us understand this attitude that we're supposed to have. And I know this is right behind me here, but keep that in your mind as we go through this because it's, it's part of the crux of the problem that they were facing. Let's read this again. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. The clanging of cymbal, the making of music, the sounds that were so beautiful, you could call this Paul's argument uh, against art. This sort of beautiful sounding, and there's a lot of art in the church. We sound wonderful when we sing together. And we teach and admonish one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's a, it's a beautiful thing that we experience. We dress up, we look good when we come, well, some of us. I try, I put on nice clothes, but that doesn't mean anything. We try our very best to put forth something that is good looking, good sounding, uh, good, well meaning. And though I do that, if I am not loving in my approach, he says, I have become a sounding brass or a, a clanging cymbal. It doesn't really make much of a noise. It doesn't mean anything. I may stand up here and preach, though I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, I can stand up here and preach to you a good sermon. And it can be factually true. And, and people will benefit from it. But if I get down and I live a wicked and perverse life, it does not benefit me anything. In fact, when people hear what I have to say, if they can see something else in my life, that's going to be louder than whatever it is that I am saying up here. It is so important to match both the message and what is from God coming out of our mouth with the way that we live. And he, he says the foundation of all that is love, what we show to other people. Some believe the influence uh, here could have been from this idea through the Roman culture, there was this push for art and these beautiful structures and these large temples and these people were walking away to do horrible things in these big, beautiful, ancient structures that they had built with their hands. And, and we would look at them like cathedrals today. There were temples back then. And you could see this and say, wow, look how big and beautiful all this is. But none of it matters if we don't have the love of God. Which is why he would then say in verse 4 through 7, love has to be truthful. It can't, it can't build itself up in iniquity, but it has to love truth. So this mattered more than the way it sounded, the way it looked. Is it beautiful? Is it pleasing? The growing spiritualism in the Christian culture, which was a vile one, was loud and showy. It was much like the prosperity preachers that we would see 
today and big thinkers that parade themselves as geniuses and master podcasters. Combine that with the spiritual gifts given to the church and you could potentially have a real problem on your hands. You could look at the culture and say, I want to be like that. And look at this philosophy that is growing here and I want to be the best and I want to do everything that I can. I'm going to be the best speaker and the best minister because that's what the culture was like. And I'm made this way, therefore I'm going to live this way. And also, I have spiritual gifts from God. That's a problem. And if you get to that point where you miss the whole point of the matter, which is, well, you don't even love. You don't even love. Then none of that matters. He then makes a, uh, an argument against, well, we could look at the philosophy of it all that was surrounding them. Let's continue reading. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. Now here are the spiritual gifts that were given to these people, and what, a, what an amazing power that they had. Wouldn't it be so great if, if I didn't have to memorize everything <laughs> and study so much? If, if this could be given to me by God, and that, would be, that would be fantastic. There were other things that were given to these people. But here are some spiritual gifts that they missed out on. You know that phrase at the end when he says, I am nothing. There was a, a push by Marcus Aurelius in Stoicism that was the I am uh, push. I am uh, in control. I am man, therefore I am dominant of myself. And Marcus Aurelius was a great thinker, and he was a great Stoic, and he was a great man that, that imparted uh, a philosophy that is helpful, in my opinion. And if you don't think it is, well, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but part of it was this sort of I am. Look at what I am. And Paul, taking these, these gifts given by God and the debauched culture around them, he says, look at these amazing things that you can do and these wonderful gifts you have been given. And if you have nothing or if you have no love, you are nothing. You are nothing. None of this matters. How about your philosophy? Your philosophy means nothing if you don't love amidst it. It just becomes some sort of tyrannical uh, race to the top to see who can be better, who can be the best. So you have, you have a number of problems charging at the church here and taking root, taking hold, and you could see it in the way that they were living. That's why these, these ideas become such a problem. People will take hold of something and they'll say, well, it's just an idea. In fact, that's one of the things that Stoicism taught. You cannot control the ideas around you, only yourself, nothing else matters. Well, the, I, it just so happens that the ideas around you can permeate. They can get into your mind and change you. And then if they get into your mind, then just like you're a robot, they're controlling you. No, you start to actually do things according to the ideas that you have floating around in your head. And even though you may have these gifts and the ability to do something, that doesn't mean you're going to use them correctly. The underpinning, the foundation to all these things is love. And it has to always be love. What about the charitable deeds that we do in our lives. Look at the next uh, portion here. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Were there poor people in Corinth? Yeah, there were a lot of them. And though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So at first he says, I, I sound like nothing. Eh, it doesn't really make a sound that 
means anything. And then he says, I am nothing. And now he says, it profits me nothing. It doesn't add anything of value to me. I may uh, be a very, very wealthy person. And I may, here's a good example. I could make a lot of money if I have a billion dollar industry. I can give millions of dollars as a tax write-off to charity. And then I will end up saving a lot of money. Now that's a, that, that's a good idea for a business. It's a good incentive to give to the poor. And a lot of people do that, and they do it with the right intention. And I say, that's what we should be doing. But if you look at that instance and you say, well, I'm going to save the money, and you give millions of dollars to help the poor, but you're doing it solely for the purpose of saving millions more dollars, does that profit your soul? Is that what's going to get you into heaven? I'm just going to make it if I give another million as a tax write-off to the poor, I've made it. I've done it. No, obviously not. The point is, the love of God has to be in every action that you do. Even the charitable deeds that you're engaged in. If I give, but I do it just as a throwaway, yeah. If I don't love, it doesn't profit me anything. I could even give my life. People can give their life out of spite, can't they? People can do things for all sorts of wrong reasons. Without love, we are nothing. But with love, they are everything. That's the point. That's the point that, that Paul is trying to make to these people. Love is going to look at the other side, the person with whom you're interacting, and it's going to prop them up above you every single time. It's going to make them everything. You're going to start showing love, and you're going to start sacrificing of your own means to build up the people around you. So let's look at this, uh, th this passage one more time. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let's zoom in on that phrase, thinks no evil. In the American Standard, it says, takes not account of evil. In the English Standard, it says, is not irritable or resentful. Strong's would say, does not take account of misdeeds doesn't keep the score someone uh, makes a comment to you maybe they mean something well and you look at that and say I bet you I bet you they meant that as a backhanded com compliment they were just trying to dig or anything someone uh, I, I knew I had a friend of mine and she had a child, and someone brought her food. I hope she watches this. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> and she got upset. She thought there was an ulterior motive behind it. Could you imagine? Doing something good for somebody, and they get the good thing, and they say, Oh, I know why you're doing this. I'll keep score. I know we're at odds right now. Therefore, everything you do, I'm going to tally up, tally up. I'm winning right now because I smiled more the last time and we talked and I was kind and you listened and all these different things. But what he's trying to say here is love thinks no evil. Could you imagine the person who looks at everything that they do? I have been sanctified. I've been washed. I've been forgiven of my sins. 
Christ came to this earth. I didn't, I didn't go up in heaven and pull him down here and force him to do this. He did it of his own accord. He humbled himself. He took on the form of a servant. He became obedient, even unto death. He did all these things, and I'm, for which I'm so thankful. And then I look at somebody else, and I just don't like that person. Which happens. Let's be fair, that happens. People, some people just don't mesh well. And I start to take account of every misdeed that they've done. After everything that Christ has done for you, you still want to treat other people that way? Maybe someone else has a different opinion spiritually than you, and it's on a certain topic that is, well, it could be um, confrontational. It, it might divide some people. The jury is still out. Scott said this morning, uh, in class and in his sermon, there were two things where he said, well, it could be this, but I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to die on that hill. I hope my soul doesn't, doesn't rest on that because I just don't know. There are certain things that are like that in Scripture. It just it's, doesn't tell you why. And some people get in their heads, well, I think it's this way. And then another person says, I think it's this way. And then there it is, you're at odds with each other. And now it's time to keep score. Oh, he was wrong about this. See, I told you. He didn't, his mind isn't right. And then we start keeping score, keeping score, keeping score. That happens a lot. Which is why I then point out how important it is to realize that love doesn't rejoice in iniquity and evil doing, but it rejoices in truth. It's important to have a love for the truth. It is. And it's important to have this attitude. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 12 through 13. Matthew chapter 9, 12 and 13. Keeping the score with others is opposite to what Christ has done with you. If he was keeping score, you would be condemned. But there's a way to go about it, isn't it? We don't just, again, turn a blind eye and say, well, people are going to be wicked. That's just how it is. In fact, that's what the Corinthian brethren argued. I was born this way. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. I was born to eat it, so therefore I'm going to eat it. What are you going to say about it? Well, that's not how we, that shouldn't be our attitude, right? We are supposed to be a holy people, but we're all trying. We're all doing our best. Paul would also say in 1 Corinthians that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If we allow this wicked to fester and grow among us, then it will do just that. It will grow to a point where, you know, we can't handle this. Have you ever read the book, My Pet Dragon? Have you ever read that book? Uh, there's another book. Oh, its name is eluding me right now. I had it before I got up here. But there is a, a boy and he's got a monster. But he doesn't want to look at the monster and the monster grows and it grows and it grows and he won't look at it. And, and then he starts to look at it and he tells his mom and his dad and they, well, whatever. And he runs outside and he tries to tell people, no, oh, whatever. And it keeps growing until it's pushing everyone inside the house up against the wall because there's a, there's a problem that they won't look at and focus on. And then eventually it just... It takes up the whole house and you can't deal with it anymore and you just, ah, it's gotten too big. That's not what I'm saying either. We have to be able to see the problems that come up in our families and in the congregation, in our communities. We have to see those things and we have to address them. This passage is coming on the heels of Paul addressing serious problems. And that's a part that we can miss. Is that keeping the score? Is that thinking evil? Well, I think they meant, no, that's not it. That's loving your father and loving his children. If you love them, then you will tell them, this, this isn't right. You need to change this. And look what happens. 2 Corinthians, we read 2 Corinthians and the, the young man had repented. 
And now they needed to let him back in. They were being too harsh on the young man. Let him back in. He was, he was sorrow with godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7.10. Let the man back into the congregation. Have the right attitude about all this. Let's read Matthew 9, 12 through 13. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well need, need no physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what it means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That was Christ's attitude. Christ, there is a passage where he looks around and it grieves, he's grieved in the spirit because all these people are like sheep with no shepherd. It's, this is a hard thing for the Savior to look and see all these people with no direction in their life. But his purpose in coming to this earth was to save sinners. And Paul would say, of whom I am chief. That's the goal. So if you were the Savior, a lot, a lot of times we think, okay, here, here's the body of baptized believers, at least I've thought this before, and we have made a commitment, therefore we are above these sorts of evil. Ephesians chapter 4, you used to be this, and, and now you are a new man. And what, what does that new man look like? Colossians chapter 3, what does that new man look like? It should look like Christ. But then we don't look like Christ for a moment. And we make a mistake. We need reminding. How should we be reminded? Should, we, should it be ignored? That's a, that was the problem with these Corinthian brethren. It was ignored for so long because the culture around them was so vile that they said, well, not a big deal. It's okay. And then they had a real problem on their hands, didn't they? Could you imagine if this young man had committed this sin, and very quickly someone said, you need to get out of this. And the congregation was strong enough to recognize those problems and with love approach that person and say, this isn't how we act. Isn't that how we should act? And, and I need to be completely honest, this congregation is very good at that. Very good at that. Uh, when, I was, when I was younger and recently, people are, are very comfortable to talk to me about, well, you shouldn't really do that. You shouldn't say that. You should live like this instead. But doing it in such a way that I almost, I'm glad that they said it. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad somebody has my back. Jesus was here and he said, this was a, a quote from the Old Testament, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. That's God, that's Jehovah's attitude towards his people. He wants mercy that's what he has planned for us and then he says for i came not to call the righteous but sinners he's looking for the people with the mistakes in their life with the mountain with the monster on their back that they can't get rid of and he's trying to point them in the right direction psalm 103 7 through 14 i want you to listen to these words the psalmist writes, he made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As compassion, uh, excuse me, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Here is our example. He says, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Though I do all these things, though I do this, though I do that, if I don't love, it doesn't mean anything. Nothing matters in the church if the individual is not first loving. God has steadfast love. 
And because of that, he is merciful and gracious. That's our example. Shouldn't we take that steadfast love that God has given us and show that without keeping score? Here's our expectation. The phrase that we read in Psalm 103, he does not deal with us according to our sins. We could be judged very quickly by God. You think about what we deserve as uh, sinful creatures. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He could judge us in the moment, and that would be well within his power. But that's not what he does, is it? He doesn't judge us according to our sins. In fact, he's patient. He waits. He gives us time. He gives us a plan. He lays it out in front of us. He, he dies for us. That's how far he's willing to go. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. That's, that's the crux of the problem in 1 Corinthians. They were without this thing that was the whole point of the gospel. The whole point of this story from Genesis to Revelation. It wasn't a part of their character. Their culture, the sin around them, the influence... Everything had spoiled them to forget about this. Now, one may say they didn't love their brothers enough to tell them what was right and wrong. So they, they couldn't start there. Well, I, they just were unwilling to tell them what was right and wrong. And then Paul gives a little bit more insight into that, saying your glory is to your shame because everything that they did was really about themselves. Doesn't he say that? Charity is not puffed up. Everything they were doing was trying to really build themselves up and make themselves look more important. We studied 3 John in the Wednesday night class. Isn't there a character in 3 John who makes everything about himself? He even doesn't uh, allow missionaries to come into the congregation because he doesn't want them taking the spotlight. He wanted everything on him. He wanted to be higher. He wanted to be greater. Diotrephes was not doing it correctly. So that's our expectation from God sometimes is that immediate punishment and immediate judgment. He has stated, I want you to think about this judgment for a moment. He has promised there will be a judgment. There will be a judgment. And we studied that this morning. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. There will be a judgment. Now, with that promise in mind, why doesn't he just judge us right now when we've sinned? Why doesn't he say, well, you made a mistake. I gave you the chance. I put you on this earth. I made you in my image. And you blew it. That's it. No. Instead, he says, there will come a day when I will judge you. Whether it is you die or I come back. Now, you have the option. And then he goes through everything that he can, he does everything he possibly can to give you the means to come back to him. And it's through the ultimate love, the ultimate charity that is shown, his son dying for you. And then he waits. He's patient with his judgment. And he tells you when it's going to be. There's a judgment day or you die. You have time. What decision are you going to make? Now, we don't know when he's coming back. We studied that this morning. You're not going to know the day, the, the time or the day when he comes back, the month or the year. You're not going to know when Christ comes back. But right now, you have the decision. You have a decision. Because God loves you so much, he has stayed his judgment from you, and he's given you the decision to live a life that these Christians had to be reminded of. So here is our struggle. Look at that next phrase. He says, He will not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For those that fear the Lord, which again, I would want to point you, charity does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. For those that fear the Lord and live the Christian life, live a life that God has prescribed, he says that he will not repay us according to our iniquities. He just wipes the slate clean. 
That's what he's done for us. And that can be for you uh, this afternoon. If you haven't been baptized, if you haven't been added to the Lord's church, you can take hold of that. You can become a Christian and your iniquities will not be repaid you. In fact, Christ died to pay for those iniquities. He was the sacrificial lamb. He was the one who paid the price. They would have been required, us, on the day of judgment, we would have had to pay each and every iniquity that we've committed. But instead, Christ paid it for us. That's how much he loves us. And that shows he's not going to keep the score anymore. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed those things from you. So I want to ask again, with, with your loved ones, the people who make mistakes around you. That's why we get irritated with the people closest to us the most, because we see them make mistakes. We see all their mistakes. We see their quirks. We're around them a lot. And it can be irritating. With those ones, have you taken those things that you're keeping score on? Could you, just like God does, could you remove those things from them as far as the east is from the west? And I have to tell you, when you start going from east to west on the globe, it's, it's just, it's forever. You're just going to keep going until you come all the way around, but then you just keep going. You will, as far as the eye can see, you could say that. Could you take those those scores that you have with other people in your life and just say, we're done. We're done with that. We're done. If it's petty, just eliminate it. Think about what God has done for you and then look at those things again. Just re-examine uh, the things that are in your life. Are you, are you willing to reconcile with people who have, well, they've hurt your feelings or they have you know, hurt your family in a certain way, or they've hurt someone you're close to, they've irritated you, whatever it is, could you reconcile to them? I'm not asking you, again, to welcome sin back into your life, but you should be able to reconcile with your brothers in Christ. And there are people in this congregation that, hey, people bicker. There are people outside of the congregation that are members here that they need to come back. We can do that. But it starts with this attitude. Love doesn't keep the score because God doesn't keep the score on us. He doesn't keep our score, our sin, in our life. He just says, it's all the way over there. Would you like that this afternoon? Would you like for your sins to be forgiven? If you need forgiveness from somebody in the congregation, uh, if you need forgiveness from the congregation, and you would, just like that young man in 1 Corinthians who had done a sin that was very public, everybody knew about it. If you'd like to be forgiven of something like that and make it right in front of the congregation, you can do that this afternoon. But if you haven't been forgiven of your sins, what are you waiting for? Why wouldn't you take hold of this gift where you take all the iniquity in your life and you put it far away from you? Because that's what God is offering you. You don't deserve it, I'll tell you that much, but that's what he's offering. Whatever it is, please come as together we stand and sing. Cross.